around to praise his name. I was able to go this morning, I popped into Westgate, they had a service this morning, and I was pleasantly surprised that uh, Bernard Lewis was there. He was taking the service this morning, so Bernard was one of our folks. In years gone by, he spent some years in Papua New Guinea as a missionary, and he's been ministering in um, a church in Newport for many years, just retired. So it's good to see, see Bernard. He did say in the service that he checked with whoever the authority is up there, if he's allowed to travel, and they said, well, it's your job, it's what you do, so you're able to travel. So he traveled down from Newport this morning, he's traveling straight back after the service this morning, so it was, it was good to be able to share fellowship here this morning with him. On Wednesday we meet, um, we have our prayer meeting and Bible study normally at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, this Wednesday we'll be meeting and we'll be having a time around the Lord's table just because it's, it's probably a bit easier at the moment. Um, the, if you decide to come on Wednesday, just take a little bit of bread with you. We can supply the wine. But if you bring your own bread, then we can gather together around the Lord's table. And that's at 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. Next Sunday we'll be back here at the same time. Three o'clock in the afternoon, so that's next Lord's Day. Just for our prayers, as many of you will be away now, that Gwyneth was rushed into hospital on Tuesday. Um, she um, she had been violently sick, but they um, they say that she's got a, um, a bleed on the brain, and she was quite poorly um, certainly the first two days. She has actually conversed with Sally since, but um, she's far from well, as you can imagine. So. We can pray for Gwyneth and remember her in our prayers. Remember Mrs. Guest on the road? I did knock her door one day this week, I think it was. She did come to the door. I stood well back. But um, she was in this, whatever it was, splint. She struggled at the door. And um, she said that she's got difficulty even sitting down because it's, it's right up the, the leg. So, um, but she's certainly not one to grumble. I'd want all the sympathy going if it was me. But um, she's, a, she's an amazing woman. So we pray, pray for Jean. For Muriel again, who'd love to be with us. And I did send around to some of you um, the, the information with regard to the couple who've gone to, um, who I met when I was in Kenya a few times. He was a pilot, she was a teacher. And the time that I was there, they, they managed to build a school from nothing to providing a school for about five or 600 children. And um, they were just going back and forth every few months, overseeing the school. And they had a couple that set, they'd set in place after them and the couple couldn't stay with it, they, they decided they had to go. Now, Birgitta and Kia, the couple I'm talking about, they're from Sweden. Kia's got to be in his 70s, and Birgitta, I would think, is also. They've got six children of their own. I think they've got about 12 grandchildren. In, in, uh, they live, by the photograph she sent me, in a lovely part of Sweden. And yet they've had to go back to Kenya to help to sort out the school now. Now, that's a couple in their 70s. They travelled to Kenya in January. And they stay in there until March. And I started to send out a, an email. It all went wrong. And I started to type out something. So I just sent the pictures at the end. But what I was saying on there was, at the end of the thing I was sending out, I said, well, that couple have got more faith than me. To actually go to Nairobi and to travel out there and to, to lock each of you in this climate. Um, they met Stephen en route, the man that we sent some money off to last year to be able to build his house. He thinks he's got this wonderfully big house now, and if you looked at the picture, it's like a shed. But he's got um, five children, and they spent a bit of time with him, had a meal with him. And um, so it was nice to be able to, to pick up that information. If, I, if you want it, I haven't sent it to you, and I can try and send it to you. Um, and that's about all the announcements, I think. So we'll come to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you, we approach you this day in none other name than your, the name of your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We can approach your throne boldly. We can come into your presence. Although we could reflect on a week and feel that we are certainly inadequate to come before a holy God. And yet we come not in our own merits. We don't come in what we feel we have achieved. But we come through the very merits, the very righteousness, and through our advocate of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, we come and approach your throne through him this day. And our, our desire is, with all the difficulties, with all the, the strangeness of our times and the gathering together, our desire is that we worship you this day. We pray that you give us a spirit of worship. Give us minds to focus and to concentrate upon you. And to be able to meditate upon your word. Pray that you will do our souls good and that we lift your name high. And as we see, feel somewhat restricted in our worship. 
We pray that you'd accept it in your, in your very sight, even this day. We thank you that there are those seeking to do similar things throughout our county, throughout our land, with all the restrictions, still seeking to worship you, for which we give you thanks. We thank you for Bernard this morning, pray that you will bless him and guide him and Linda in their future as they look to the next phase in their lives. We praise and thank you for your goodness to them over the years and the way you've, you've kept them. We've been reminded already, Lord, of those in far off fields. We've thought of Stephen there in, in Kenya and the work that he's seeking to do. Pray that you'll guard him from the COVID, guard him from the dangers that are around him, and that you'd use him and bless him in that particular vicinity. For Begita and Kia, we're amazed that they're willing to, to go at their age and to be willing to, to, to put themselves under so much danger so that they can help to, to support that school there in, in Loki Chogi. We pray that you'll be with them. Protect them and keep them, we pray. As we come back home, we think of our own land. We think of the decisions that are being made now over this weekend. And we pray that you'll give much wisdom to those that lead us and those that guide us. And that, Father, that although they seem to be little thought of you, we pray, Lord, that you will at least guide them and direct them to be able to make decisions that will be good for this country. We would long to hear the day when our leaders and the land is turning to you in prayer and seeking your guidance. So we, we pray for them. Heavenly Father, we pray again for those in difficult times at this time. We pray for the family of Gwyneth. We commend them to you. We ask for Gwyneth that you'll give her the strength and the help that she needs at this time and the grace to be able to meet the difficulties that she's going through. Heavenly Father, we pray for Sally. We pray for the rest of the family that you will be with them. Give them peace and help and strength. And may you even be gracious and put your hand upon Gwyneth, we pray. We think also of Mrs. Guest. We thank you for her. We pray that you will help her at this time, give her the strength that she needs to be able to cope with all the difficulties that she knows. For Muriel, likewise, we commit her into your hands also. So continue with us, we pray, and bless us, and accept our worship, for we ask this in your name. Amen. So we're going to have our first hymn, which is all people that on earth do dwell. <coughs>
you know at the beginning of the hymns, it's, it's hymns that have been taken from a conference, which I've been to over a number, a number of times over the years. Some others here have been there. It's to Aberystwyth. with the, they take over the university and the Evangelical Movement of Wales, they, they hold a conference there. There's probably about 1,400, I suppose, go to it. Well, then if you noticed who was leading the singing there, you could hear the, the singer in the background was Bernard. So I hadn't, I'm Bernard, I saw this morning, I'd forgotten that when I, when I checked the tape. He's obviously on the platform lead, leading the service, and he's got a distinct voice, must be a Pembrokeshire voice. So if you could hear a voice then over the singing, it was Bernard himself, which I, I'd forgotten. So uh, there we are. We're going to read from Exodus in chapter 32. Continuing in the events surrounding the life of, of Moses. Moses has been up on the mountain. He's gone back to have dealings with God. And in verse 15 we read these words. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain. And the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the noise of the shout of victory, nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. And so it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And so Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf, which they had made, burnt it in the fire, ground it to powder, he scattered it on the water, and he made the children of Israel drink it. Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? So Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, they are, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. As for the, this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, Whosoever has gold, let them break it. And so they gave it to me. I cast it into the fire, and this calf came out. Now when Moses saw the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained um, them, to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from the entrance to entrance through the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion and every man his neighbour. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord that he may bestow on you a blessing this day for every man has opposed his son and his brother. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, so now I will go up to the Lord, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin, and I have made for, themse and have made for themselves a god of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot out of your book which you have written, or block, sorry, forgive this sin, but if not, I pray, pray, block me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. And so the Lord plagued the people because of what they did, the calf which Aaron made. Amen. Jeremy's going to speak to you girls for a few minutes, I think. Yeah. Oh. 
your hand up. Now then, when I was your age, girls, in our house, we never had one of these. We had to go around the corner to a box. There was a red box, and inside that box was a phone. And you put money in it, and it allowed you to ring people. But then as I got a bit older, my parents got one of these. Now, I don't think you girls would like one of these phones, because you've got to use your finger, not doing this. You've got to turn the dial. You've got to do this. But our next one, that's more like the phones we have in our houses today. They're small, you can pick them up, you can take them around the house, and you just push buttons. But you know, they've got even further than that. They've got phones like this, where you can now phone anywhere, at any time, to anyone. And you know what, girls? None of my children use house phones. None of them. I don't know whether you girls use house phones. No? Nobody uses house phones. They all use this as their phone. And that's all they use. The big problem with phones is that sometimes when you ring people, they're out. So you can't get in touch with them. Sometimes if you ring a house phone, it's busy. I've rung your granddad a few times and it's busy. So I can't get through. Sometimes the person on the other end sees who it is and won't answer the phone. So they won't talk to you. And that's hard if you want to talk to someone. If they're out or they're busy or they won't speak. The wonderful thing about God is when you want to talk to him, he's never busy. When you want to talk to God, he's always there. And when you want to talk to him, he always listens and he always answers. So whether we're in school or at home or out playing with our friends, we know that we can talk to God at any time. He's never busy. He's never out. And he always listens. And he always answers. Well, we're going to look at those verses that I read to you in um, Exodus and chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. 32 even. Sorry, Exodus 32. And what we're going to be doing this, this afternoon, we're going to be asking this simple question, who is on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? We're going to think about three things. Moses is going to confront these people with their problem, with their sin. We're going to see that there is consequences for sin, or sin consequences. And then we're going to see that there is a time that we have to make a choice, and we have to choose. So that's where we are, that's where we're going today. Exodus chapter 25 through to chapter 31 was about God giving Moses the commands on how he was to be worshipped. To give them the Ten Commandments and so forth. How they were to work these things out. And we, we said that very early on we find they rebel against the commandments that God has just given to them. Already they seem as if, last time we saw, they've started breaking the first two commandments. They've made an, a, a, an image, they've made a, a golden calf, and they're worshipping through a golden calf. And so already they're going against the God. There's idolatry, we call it, in the camp. And idolatry was going to dog the children of Israel all through the history. Everywhere they went, they seemed to get sucked in to what was around them and what was happening in the day. And here we have their first act of worship after God has given Moses the, 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 the um, directions in which they should go. They've already gone the wrong way while Moses has gone back up to the mountain. <coughs> they've already made a grave, graven image. So we got, first of all, we see Moses' confession confrontation. Moses is up the mountain. God has told him what's going on down below. He's got the two tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. He starts his descent down the mountain. En route he meets up with another man who has been waiting for him. His name is Joshua. Now Joshua has been waiting 40 days and 40 nights somewhere on the mountain waiting for Moses to come down. Now this man is some man, this Joshua. You read about him later on in the Bible. Very faithful man, diligent in the things of God, 
He was a man who could wait 40 days and 40 nights on his own on a mountain for Moses to come back down. The people couldn't wait. They got fed up waiting for Moses. They decided to take things into their own hands. We're thankful for the Joshua's in this world. We're thankful for those who wait patiently. For those who have patience to wait and to trust in God. So as they descend down the mountain, Moses and, and Joshua together, they come down and they begin to hear noise because there's a great activity going on in the camp. The people are so-called involved in some kind of worship. Joshua hears the noise and he thinks to himself what he says to Moses, that sounds like there's a war going on down there in the camp. What's all the noise? Moses says in verse 18, there's no war. He says there's singing in that camp. And he's basically saying the singer I, singing I fear is not the singing and the things that we want to hear. In verse 19, we find that they come in sight of the camp. The two of them are coming down the side of the mountain. And we see they suddenly get this, this image before them of this golden calf. Just have the Ten Commandments given to them. Just been told you shall not worship any other god. You shall not bow down to any graven image. And already the children of Israel have this golden calf before them. So in verses 19 and verses 20 there. He watches them. They're paying homage. They're dancing. The word that was used earlier was they were playing, which has sexual connotations to it. There was some kind of, you know, um, debased in involvement which was going on around that particular um, idol. Verses 19 and 20, Moses' reaction. He sees for himself what God has told him was going on and he's got the two tablets of stone and he throws them to the ground and they, they break as he's horrified by what he sees. Verse 21, he, he uses this term, their great sin. Three times in this section he uses that term. He sees their great sin and he's actually horrified by it. He sees they've turned away from God. He sees that they're breaking God's law and they are deserving of any judgment that God would pour out upon them. And this is a strong reaction. He throws down the, the tablets of stone. We find then that he looks at the people. He confronts the people. And, and he displays his total disappointment and his, his anger at what they had done already. So he shows us immediately how God thinks about sin. Here's God's, God's mediator between the people and himself. Here's his reaction to, to what he sees. He's angry that they've turned against the things of God. Verse 20. We find then what actually happens is Moses goes into the camp. He makes sure they take this golden calf and they put it in the fire and they melt the golden calf down. So Already we find that they've taken what they thought was something special and he's taken it and he's thrown it in the fire and he's destroyed the idols. In chapter 23 and verse 34 of Exodus, they were already told, when you go into these foreign lands, you'll see these idols. What I want you to do is to destroy these idols because you're not to have any involvement with the things of this world, the things that are against my word. Destroy the idols. What have they done? They've already made an idol. So Moses has it thrown into the, into the fire. The, the gold dust that comes out, what he does, somehow or other, he scatters the dust on water. And then he makes the people drink the water, which has gold dust in it. To show them how, how abhorrent their sin was before God as he confronts their sin. And as he comes before them. And, and they have to drink the very water. They drink the very gold dust that they give them. To be able to make this golden calf. They were showing in one sense that, you know, what, what, what they were doing, they were, they were showing that that which affects the outward has often come from the inward. There was that in their hearts which had shown that they were going contrary to God. And so he makes them, as it were, absorb that which they've already done and they've already failed from that, that which was within their hearts. In verse 21 and 22, or 21 to 24 in fact, Moses confronts Aaron. Now he left Aaron, his brother, in charge of the people. And he says to Aaron, basically he says, how could you let these people carry out such sin and such evil? 
How could you allow it to happen? Aaron stands up. He says, look, you know this people. You know how they are prone to sin. You know how they can easily turn to evil. It's their fault. Now, this is Aaron who was left in charge. And you know how often people make excuses for their sin. You've only got to go back to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, and find there right at the beginning, they were offloading the problem onto somebody else. Adam was saying, it's that woman. You gave me a partner. Look what the woman made me do. She made me sin. He was making out it was Eve's problem, not his. And often, if we're, if we're honest, when we do things which are wrong, when we sin, when we break God's law, often what we do is that we say it's, there's a reason behind it. It's the circumstances I found myself in. It's the influences that are around about me. It's my background. It's some kind of psychological deficiencies I may have in my character or in my makeup. It, it's the, the, the situation that I found myself placed in. And we find here that this man, is, he, he's trying to say that this, this is not my problem. He's saying, really, it's these people, it's their problem. And we look for something to be able to blame or someone to blame for our, reason, for our failures. In verse 21, Moses seems to say to them, how could you allow this to happen? How could these people force you to go and make a golden calf for them? How could you, you, you be involved with such idolatry and bring about such terrible shame? It's as if he's almost saying to them, what method did they use to make you to conform? Did they bend your fingers back? Did they threaten your family? Did they take you and threaten your life? How could you have given in to these people to cause such sin to be obvious in the camp? Moses knew that, as Aaron said, these people were prone to sin. But he should have withstood them. He should have stood against the sin. He should have been able to stand and say, this is not what God has commanded. So they confronted with their sin. And that's what God does. He, he confronts us with our sins. And too often we want to get our clothes. We want to be able to blame somebody or something or my background or my character. We say we're responsible. We're accountable for our sins. And sin then has consequences. And verse 24, Aaron's seeking to squirm out of the, the consequences himself. He, he, he tries to, to, to bring some kind of supernatural or spiritual bent upon the situation. What he says was, these people hounded me. And they, they, they wanted me to make a, 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 something they could see tangible that they could worship through. So in the end, I said to them, give me your golden earrings. So they gave the golden earrings to, to Aaron. And then he goes on and says, as if to try to justify his actions, he says something miraculous happened. I took all these golden earrings and I threw them in the fire and out came this golden calf. Some remarkable, miraculous thing took place. And you know, it's amazing sometimes when people do things wrong or people, even Christians, are going against God's word how sometimes they can try and put a spiritual bent on it. Have you ever come across somebody who tells you they've had a vision? And you try and tell somebody you didn't have a vision, and then you're calling them a liar. Or they say that, that you know, God has told me something. Or they, they, they've seen something remarkable in the scriptures, and they pick out a verse and say, God gave me this verse. And it was totally out of context with everything else, but it, it was the verse that, that convinced me I should go and do such and such. Moses doesn't even seem to bother to respond to him. The calf just kept, Moses isn't interested in his silly, miraculous, spiritual jargon, as it were. People make excuses, don't they? We, we, we try to find reasons and our answers. And, you know, someone commits adultery. And it's always the, their partner's fault, isn't it? It's always that the, the partner wasn't the partner they should have been. So we blame the, the partner or the other partner. Or someone's dishonest. And they say, you see, I had to be dishonest in work because if I wasn't dishonest, I'd have never kept my job. So I, I had to tell a few lies and alter things a little bit. Or someone says, I'd love to be committed to the Christian faith and be more committed to the work of God. But somehow or other, there's these other things. I've got family, I've got friends, I've got things. And all oh, we've got these excuses and excuses just like Aaron. But we're told one day we'll stand before the judgment throne. One day we're going to stand before God himself. 
And you know what? We could stand there, we could bring with us a pile of literature that we could plant as excuses for why we acted as we did. But how will we stack up before a holy God? Because God is a God of justice. He's a God who, who will judge sin. There's consequences to sin. In verses 25 and following, Moses had already make them, made them drink the water with the gold dust in it. And he shows how ridiculous it was to worship an idol that now you're drinking. How powerful was that idol that he allowed you to melt him down? Moses is back. The mediator now is back. The mediator has been away. But now he's back. The mediator has come to them and now they feel at least we can see Moses now. What Jeremy said, I don't give him um, directions on what to give his little talk on. But what he was saying ties in because really we've got a mediator who's always on the end of the phone. He's never far away. We haven't got a, we haven't got a book an appointment. We haven't got to be in, in church. We haven't got to be in a certain situation. Our mediator is ever open to what we've got to say. We can approach him at any time in any place. He isn't up on the mountain where we can't see him and we're wondering what's going on. And he's there. We can pray to him now. We can pray to him in the quietness of our hearts now. We can pray to him tonight. We can pray on our bed if we can't sleep at night. We can pray to him at any time in any place. Because we have a mediator between us and God. It's not Moses. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 tells us there is only one mediator between God and man and that is the man Christ Jesus. The only mediator. 1 John chapter 2 and, and verse 1 tells us our hope is found in Jesus Christ. Even if we sin, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. So there's consequences for sins. God will judge sin, but actually he's judged sin in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an advocate. We have a mediator with God, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He never goes away. He never leaves us, and he never slumbers, and he never sleeps. Now, as you get older, as you find out, Jeremy, as you get older, in the afternoon after dinner, sometimes you, you're gone, aren't you? 20 minutes, mouth open, head back, and you're gone to sleep. And the children, if they come in, well, granddad's he's in a different world for a few moments. But I've, I've known it all. Our mediator never slumbers, never sleeps. He's never up on the mountain. He's never out of sight. He's never so far away he isn't sure what's going on. He knows all that we need and all that we require. So these people, they were involved in this frivolous, this wild, silly performance of worship. They'd forgotten the holiness and the majesty of Almighty God. They'd moved away from the reverence they should have shown towards their God. And they're involved in some kind of silly worship. And there'll be consequences for that. And it will require that they'll have to make a decision. There's a time or a day to choose who we're going to serve. Moses, here was the moment he was saying you need to make a decision, verse 25 to 29. He says in verse 26, he says this, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. So here he is, probably up on a, on a, on a, a mounted piece of ground, the thousands of people around about him. Now he said, who's ever on the Lord's side, you come and you stand by me. Be on my side. A little later in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, this godly man Joshua. Now he's leading the people of Israel now into, into the promised land. He's going to be the great leader. And he says to the people a similar thing. He says, choose yourself this day who you will serve. And then he says this, but as for me and my household... We are going to serve the Lord. Make your choice, says Joshua. He'd heard Moses saying the same thing at the foot of Mount Sinai. Make your choice. Here was Israel's chance to repent and turn to the Lord. To avoid the consequences that sin brings. The time to choose. Are you going to obey God? Are you going to worship Him? Are you going to keep His commandments? 
Are you going to go your own way in life or are you going to follow God's way? Now thankfully, over the history of this world, God has always had a remnant of people who have sought to follow him. Now at times there have been great numbers. But other times in the history of the church, there's been a small number of people who said, whatever other people are doing, whatever the, the mass thinking of the day is, we have chosen to stand by the side of our God. We've chosen to serve him. Now we're living in such a day. This is a village of about a thousand, I suppose, in population. And here we are, even with people outside the village, with, what are we, less than 20. Because we are not living in an age when most people give time and thought to God. I would have thought, following what's gone on in the last 12 months, people would have begun to see how life is so delicate. That people would have begun to see this life is not certain. There's got to be more. This put life into perspective. The things which were so important. You can't go and watch your rugby match. You can't go out on the night on the tiles on a Saturday. You can't do those things anymore. And you thought people would, but it isn't happening at the moment, is it? But who knows what God will do. But thankfully, there's always been a remnant who will stand at the side of Almighty God. There was a tribe here that chose to follow Moses. The tribe of Levi come out, and they stand at the side of Moses. Moses says something which sounds hard to us. He says, take your swords, you men of Levi, strap your sword to your side. And he says, I want you to go into the camp, and I want you to make execute judgment. He doesn't say go into the count, camp and have some seminars and see if you can talk the people around. This is, this is judgment. God is saying, go into the camp, take your swords. And he says, when you go into the camp, and I presume he could identify the people who were rebellious and who were the leaders and ringleaders or what have you, go into the camp, and you may find them, it doesn't say this, but I think, find the ringleaders, and then he's dealing with them. And verse 28, the Levites were to become God's instrument, instruments of justice. They were to put to death those who wouldn't stand by God, who wouldn't repent. Now there's thousands down there, thousands, probably close to a million. We're told 3,000 were put to death by the sword. Well, they could well have been the ringleaders, we're not told. But God is a loving God, he's a merciful God. But he is a just God, and there is consequences to sin. Paul later in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and through verses 1 to 12 there, he says, he uses this whole illustration of what happened at the Mount Sinai, at the foot of Mount Sinai, to say how dangerous it is for people who know better to go against the things of God. Here was a huge test for the Levites. They were to go into the camp, and even if it was a blood relation, they were to execute him or her. Well, that took some doing. That wasn't easy. They were proving, no matter what was their natural inclination, they were to obey God. Make your choice. The Levites were to become the priests, the, the, the very tribe of the priests in, in Israel. They were showing their obedience to God, and it was going to override everything else which was natural to them. Verse 30, now Moses, as the mediator, as the advocate, he reminds the people again this term of their great sin. This is no trivial thing. This is a great sin. Already God had brought a measure of judgment upon the people here. Now there was hope because they have a mediator. He was willing to step in before them and to represent the people. So verse 31 to 32, he prays on behalf of the people. He mediates before, between God and the people. And remember, Moses hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't sinned. But he's pleading on behalf of the people. He doesn't shy away from the severity of what this was. Again, he's saying, they have committed a great sin. But now he pleads for God's mercy and God's forgiveness. Now they deserve, the whole tribe were involved probably, the whole congregation, I should say, were involved. But now probably many of them have realized this sin. Some of them hadn't. But Moses was willing to, to step in where those people deserved judgment. He seeks to make atonement for this sin. It's as if he, he says, look, if justice has got to be satisfied, let it fall upon me. Bring it upon me. Blot my name out of your book. But let the judgment fall on me, he says. 
God wouldn't allow Moses to become their substitute. He wouldn't allow Moses to become the one who would take the judgment for all the people. But it's a wonderful reminder, isn't it, of one who did become the one who would take the judgment and become the substitute for sin. And that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, you see, speaking about the great mediator, Jesus Christ, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So there's consequences for our choices. Verse 33 and following there. God would guide and provide for them. But later, God knew they would still often turn away from him. He said there would be a plague that would come upon them. And sometimes God delays judgments. Sometimes we sin and we think we got away with it. Nobody knew, nobody saw, we got away with it. But there's consequences to sin. And unless we repent and we turn away from our sins, unless we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us for our sins because he died for our sins, there will be consequences. Consequences, it says, be sure your sins will find you out. So we think we got away with it. We sailed through life and nobody ever knew. We've got to stand before the great judge. And we will have consequences. And those consequences may even be eternal consequences of judgment. Moses is saying here, who is on the Lord's side? It's the time for choosing. Now you can't choose what family you're going to be born into. You can't make that choice. You can't choose your friends. You can't choose your family. We say to children when they're growing up, growing up you've got to make choices. Early on, the friends they make will have a great influence upon them in their lives, for good or for bad, won't they? So we say to the kids, be careful who you make as your friends. They get older, they have to make choices on their exams, which will have a great impact upon their future. University, work, or what have you. They make a major decision, who are they going to marry? Who are they going to spend their lives with? And these decisions, all the way through life, choosing what we're going to do are vital decisions. But here is the vital decision, the most important one. Whose side are we on? We may have come to a point in our lives, perhaps in days gone by, we hear the gospel. We hear that Jesus Christ, despite our failings and sin, Jesus Christ came into the world to die for our sins. And we heard someone telling us, preaching whatever it was, we could be cleansed and forgiven for our sins, not because of what we try to do, but because of what he has done. We call upon the name, or we called upon the name of Jesus Christ to forgive us for our sins. And we've known ever since the grace of God in our lives. Someone challenged us by what they said, or what we read, or what we heard. Or perhaps we've heard things like that, and we've halted between two opinions. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, remember Elijah's up on the mountain there, and he's, there's this great thing going on, again, idolatry. To, and Moses says, look, Here's the choice. Are you going to follow Baal, that false god? Or are you going to follow the God? Choose this day who you're going to follow. Some people come to faith very young in life. If you read about Timothy, Timothy, we believe Timothy came to, came to faith, and you read about him in the latter part of the New Testament. He came to faith by listening to what his mum had to say and his grandmum had to say. It says he sat on the knee and he heard the scriptures being read. And from a very young age, Timothy was a follower of God. Some were confronted with Jesus Christ to put their faith in him. And they found that the cost was too great. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to get to heaven? Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. And I've done that since I was a youngster. And Jesus knew that was impossible. He said, well, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. That would be the starting point. The Bible says he went away a sad man because he owned much. The cost was too great. He couldn't make that choice. People know there's a way to God, but there are two ways in this world. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14 in the, on the Sermon on the Mount there, he says this, doesn't he? He says, look, you listen to this. He says, enter by the straight gate for the wide for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate 
and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few that find it. Jesus speaks of this fact that there is two ways. And people get challenged. And some of them stop and they think, there's the choice. Do I go with the masses? Everybody's going that way. Hang on, there's not many going this way and it looks quite difficult. Well, there's the choice. Jesus speaks of counting the cost before we follow him. Some people think it's too late. They feel they've neglected God all their lives. They haven't committed themselves to him. Why would God be interested to, at them at the end of their lives? Well, we've said it many times, the thief on the cross, he's coming to the last hours of his life and he realizes. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, you had plenty of opportunity. You've been in this world for whatever years. Jesus says, no, no, you look to me for forgiveness. Today, when you die, today you will be with me in paradise. There are those that seem to follow and they followed for a little while. They faltered as we find they get involved and engulfed with the things of this world. Like the sower and the weeds come and take over their life. Or they're like Demas that Paul speaks about who had forsaken him. Some think, I followed Jesus. I put my faith in him. But I faltered. And my life has been such a mess thing since. I can't really expect him to have me in his, in his kingdom. Well, all I'd say to people like that is to go and read Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, David remembers his silly sins, terrible sins, adultery, murder, and he pleads for forgiveness with God. Peter denies Jesus three times, and Jesus doesn't say, that's you out, three times and you're out. No, no, Jesus forgives him because he was truly sorry. So there's none too late. There's none who's done too, too many bad things. There's none too young to come to Jesus. And then others think, if I had to make this choice, I, I couldn't keep it up. If I said I was going to become a Christian, I couldn't keep it up because I'm not that sort of character. And I wouldn't have it. And you're absolutely right. And I'd be absolutely right. We could not keep it up. But we believe it's by the grace of God that we are what we are. And his grace is sufficient to get us through this life and to follow him. We believe we are responsible for the choices that we make. And we will be accountable for them. But also, we need faith to believe. And the wonderful thing about the gospel is, do you know, even that faith is given to us. We're told if we come to him, we have that faith, he's given us that faith. And he will turn none away. So the question we ask, who is on the Lord's side? Moses, well, he has to confront the people. He has to tell the people there are consequences to their sin. But he is saying... There is a choice to be made. Come to my side or go to the side of the majority, the wise way. We're going to sing this hymn, which is Onward March, All Conquering Jesus.
lockdown, but um, and when we be free, but I'm looking forward to the day when we can actually sing. You feel shackled, you want to, you want to sing praise to God, whether it's the Welsh in us, I don't know what it is, but um, just want to be able to sing praises to God. So I'm looking forward to that day when we, we don't have to feel shackled and we can sing praises to God again. But let's just bow our heads. So Father in heaven, we thank you that we come to one who never slumbers. We come to one who never sleeps, one whose eye is ever towards his people. We thank you that before your throne there is one who is a great mediator, one who you accepted as that atoning sacrifice for our sin. We pray that each one of us will have known what it is to put our trust in him and him alone. We thank you that there is hope found in him and that we can stand by his side. Pray that we will choose this day who we will serve and we will follow hard, hard after him. So go with us, we pray. Keep us and bless us. We ask in your name. Amen. <laughs>